for D and I, we've heard the business case for building those inclusive cultures, you know, more likely to be high performing, more likely to have better business outcomes, and more likely to uh, meet or even exceed those financial targets. Mm. And there is no necessarily universal proven strategy for successfully creating an inclusive culture. We know you can't just copy and paste or replicate someone's culture. It has to be something that's built. But Mm. with that in mind, can the culture of your organization be truly inclusive without that consideration for the neurodiverse population, can we really build that culture without considering this big part of our organizations as well? This this affects up to around 15% of the working population, right? So so mm-hmm. it, it is a it is a, a significant percentage of the constituency in any organization of the of the population. That's it. You can probably look around and think in my team, in my colleagues, how many of them potentially have a neurodiverse condition, definitely. Mm-hmm. So you're talking about what? So 15. You're talking about roughly one in six, right? That's it, definitely. So in your teams, it's highly likely that you have a teammate, a direct report, or someone in an organisation, or a high portion of your organisation that will have one of those neurodiverse conditions, which highlights the mm. importance of focusing on what exactly it is as well. When we use the word neurodiversity, what is it? What is it that we actually mean? Yeah. So I've got sort of a definition on screen there. So you can define neurodiversity as referring to the different ways in which the brain processes and interprets information. You know, we we naturally think differently about things. We have different interests, different motivations, but we're also naturally better at some things and poorer at others. So neurodiversity, the term, it's an umbrella term for a set of different skill profiles that include dyslexia, uh, dyspraxia, ADHD, autism, Tourette's syndrome, and uh, quite a few more conditions as well. So there's no one one right way of thinking or behaving or learning. Um, But the really key thing I want to highlight here is that these differences shouldn't shouldn't necessarily be uh, viewed as deficits. No, I think that's that's really key, isn't it? Um, It's Mm -hmm. it's it's something that firstly, that idea that there is no wrong one right way of thinking, Mm -hmm. uh, which often efforts towards creating an organizational culture often steer you towards the idea that there is one right right way of thinking. So that's Mm -hmm. that's quite complicated. It's a quite complicated idea. Mm -hmm. That's it. Um, We see with neurodiverse conditions, they do often co-occur as well. So it's not that one individual has one condition. It's left there. There is a. Uh, more likely that that individual will be diagnosed with another neurodiverse condition as well. So the chances are much more likely as well. But we were also currently seeing an increase in awareness, which is great. It means that people can recognize traits within themselves, traits in others related to a neurodiverse condition. And it means that they're more likely to see that diagnosis now. So although, yes, it's still probably in a a work in progress, it means that we're more likely to see individuals with neurodiverse conditions now more than ever. What is also key to know, like we've said, that we've got that 15, 20 percent of the population are estimated to be neurodiverse. But if you look at the statistics from the National Autistic Society, they report that only 16 percent of autistic adults in the UK actually are in full time employment. But 70 percent of those unemployed autistics say they actually want to be in work. So that's oh. where employers willing to step in and really support and minimize that gap because the question is, why is there a gap in the first place? Mm. Let's just go over that again. So 16%, one six of autistic mm-hmm. adults in the UK are in full-time employment right now, which is, yes. that's remarkable. I mean, 84% aren't. And 77% of that, of that constituency are saying that they want to be in full-time work, which again, doesn't just, talk about um, the, the need for building an inclusive workplace to include these people it actually talks about you know that there's talent there that, that organizations aren't employing and aren't tapping into that's the really really striking striking statistic um, if we if we talk move on to talking a little bit about some of the specific neurodiverse conditions that we've mentioned earlier starting with dyslexia as you said earlier it, it's the one that perhaps people are most familiar with isn't it yeah, definitely. To some extent, I think this is the one people are more familiar with. Maybe it's because of education. You have uh, different children in, in your classrooms that, are, that have dyslexia. It is that mm. one that is more frequently has been talked about in the past. So dyslexia is um, that genetic difference in an individual's ability to learn and process information. Those with dyslexia are typically really highly creative alongside mm. an amazing imagination. Um, they're more likely to think in images. 
Uh, they're typically problem solvers, so they can appreciate the bigger picture or think outside the box and typically quite empathetic. So that's just a few strengths, just to name a few there. But what we see when it comes to dyslexia is that there are uh, challenges with aspects of reading and writing. So they may experience difficulty with processing information in their short term memory. Um, and this can mean difficulty in putting detail um, into order or as well as maintaining focus. And there may also be challenges around concentration, particularly with things like background noise. So you see. So how do those, sorry, so I was going to say, how, how does that sort of manifest itself in a workplace then? Yeah, exactly that. So you hear me sort of say things like background noise. So working mm. in things like open plan offices, it makes things extremely more difficult when there's a lot of noise going on. You're trying to focus on a specific task. So it'll impact things like completing written work. So the speed at getting thoughts down in writing are affected, as well as spelling and proofreading, um, listening and making notes at the same time particularly that background noise, that can be tricky as well as absorbing written information visually as well. So it can make working in certain environments really difficult. Um, and it can also co-occur with visual difficulties as well. You may hear things like visual stress or just visual difficulties, um, which can impact fine vision tasks like reading those uh, small pieces of text. Um, and, and so, yeah, and dyslexia, as you say, it's one that's often recognised quite quite early often mm -hmm. um uh, you know we maybe everyone may remember someone from school um or if it, it could be themselves or someone that they went to school with um who who had a diagnosis of dyslexia um what about um if we move on what about talking about dyspraxia or uh, and i know there's another that's that's a term that people might be more familiar with we also refer to it as dcd as well um mm -hmm. just tell us a little bit about that yeah, so when it comes to dyspraxia, like you said, more recently referred to more as developmental coordination disorder, so DCD, um, this very much impacts, um, it, although it affects people, uh, the changes change over time, the effects change over time, sorry, dyspraxia DCD is very much a lifelong difference in the way the brain functions. So with DCD, we see really strong oral communication skills, again, amazing problem solving and creativity. When it comes to DCD, challenges start to arise when we consider things like coordination and motor skills. So it'll impair sort of the organization of movement. So we might focus on things like gross motor skills or fine motor skills. So where we see this impacting is things like running or balancing, um, handwriting and tying shoelaces. Um, okay, so, so, just, just to, so just to define, so gross motor skills mm -hmm. is things like running, so sort of whole body movement. Um, mm -hmm fine motor skills, things like tying shoelaces, writing, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's it. So someone might describe themselves as being clumsy or frequently bumping into objects. That can be quite a key indicator of potentially um, having DCD or dyspraxia. DCD is also associated with problems of language and perception and thought as well. So for example, it can impact that perception of time. So interpreting and managing time. So if we you know, wanted to estimate how long it'll take to do something, we might budget 45 minutes, an hour. That idea of estimating how long something will take can be quite difficult. So it impacts things like arriving on time to an appointment or a location or a meeting. Um, mm -hmm. And it can also impact working with directions as well. But we also see this in other areas like daily living tasks. So getting dressed and um, putting outfits together, buttoning things and planning and prioritizing the sequence in our days as well. So there's different impacts there as well. But when we think about the workplace, again, you might see mm -hmm. DCD um, impacts in terms of how one learns skills or thinks or remembers information. So certain things with a computer. So the use of the keyboard re typically requires some kind of uh, coordination. Sorry. So you might see some alternative techniques. Memory can impact things like planning skills and managing and organizing a workload can be difficult. Um, so prioritizing and working out how long something can take again. Um, communication as well, following oral instructions and taking part in discussions can be impacted. And I mentioned handwriting earlier. So, you know, general writing skills can also be impacted there as well. Mm -hmm. Just before we move off this one, uh, Steph, quickly, um, we've used two terms, dyspraxia and, and DCD. Mm -hmm. They are used interchangeably, I know, but there is a subtle difference between them, isn't there? Just, do you want to just explain that quickly? Yeah, it's, it's something that's um, not commonly really discussed, um, but there is those differences between uh, the diagnostic process. So some might find that the diagnostic process for DCD is more robust um than the other as well as more defined so 
as of late, you're more likely to receive that diagnosis of developmental coordination disorder rather than dyspraxia, which has more of a looser definition. DCD is that more robust side of things. So you may commonly now see um, dyspraxia more likely to be referred to as developmental coordination disorder rather than dyspraxia. Right. OK, thank you for that. Um, and then the last one that we mentioned specifically um, uh, earlier on was ADHD. Um, mm -hmm. uh, so that's... Um, uh, Firstly, I would like to go through a definition of that because, again, I know that there's there can be differences here and different terms mm -hmm. are used. Um, mm -hmm. so, so just tell us a little bit about ADHD. Yeah, so ADHD, taking maybe a DSM-5 type uh, definition, it is very much associated with high levels of hyperactivity, impulsivity and inattentive behaviours that typically will begin in early childhood. Um, mm -hmm. It's typically persistent over time and it will be pervasive across different situations. So it's consistent as well. Um, and, and ADHD itself stands for Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. That's correct, right? That's it. I did, I did miss out sort of the, the meaning behind the acronym, but that's correct there. So Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. Um, and, and again, and, uh, you started with the strengths of the previous two. There are some strengths that come with this as well, aren't there? That's it as well. Um, I think it's really important to highlight those strengths again with ADHD. So typically what we have with those with ADHD, there's a strength of theirs is the proactiveness, their ability to adapt really well to different situations. Um, you also have that hyper focus, so super deep concentration, particularly when it's related to an area of their interest and just amazing resilience, working really well under pressure as well. So there are so many strengths that come with having these neurodiverse conditions. It, it's curious, isn't it, that actually when we talk about ADHD, people often think of people's inability to concentrate and maintain focus. There is actually a sort of other end of that spectrum where they almost become yeah. hyper-focused, which can be a real benefit. Yeah, definitely. I think when we think of ADHD, there's that focus that, oh, they can't focus, uh, that focus, or they can't focus. But mm. the, the case is that when it comes to certain tasks, yes, there may have been some procrastination earlier, but when it comes to it, there is that ability to actually really hyper focus more so than a neurotypical individual. So it means mm. that deep concentration uh, in particular areas. Mm -hmm. And so let's move on to some of the challenges that this can present. Um, just firstly, just generally, and then we'll, we'll, we'll move it into talking about our workspace as well. Yeah, so if we sort of focus on those three areas, so that inattention, that hyperactivity and impulsivity, when it comes to inattention, it can have challenges when it comes to looking at things with that attention to detail that that can be lacking and it can be difficult to uh, focus thoughts or become quite easily distracted and jump between tasks mm -hmm. and when we look at that hyperactivity side of things um, that can be associated with restlessness or fidgeting so that mm -hmm. inability to relax or sit still just as I am sort of in this meeting and <laughs> that constant talking as well maybe that more in incessant talking so when in a situation particularly when it's passionate topic there can be that consistent talking as well mm. and then focusing on impulsivity it can make uh when it comes to making decisions it can make it uh difficult to consider other factors so making decisions without thinking of other things basically and mm. also that impatience as well so things like waiting in traffic or queues or even conversations that are maybe quite long it can uh, create some difficulties there with, with focusing and being a bit impulsive there as well. Mm -hmm. So so in a workplace context, we're talking about difficulties in maintaining focus, which is which can be really difficult in a workplace. We're talking about mm -hmm. restlessness that you mentioned there, which can mean sitting at a desk for long periods or, or staying in one place for long periods. If you work in retail, if you work in manufacturing, if you work in other places, mm -hmm. we're not just thinking about office roles here. Um, but what I found really interesting as well was that, was that um, difficulty with competing tasks. Uh, as well that, mm -hmm. that how does that manifest itself Steph because that that can be a mm -hmm. big part of ADHD can't it yeah so say you're trying to plan your day and you have these competing tasks it's difficult to work out what takes priority so oh. they're both important mm -hmm. and it's difficult to work out how long should be spent focusing on each one so you have these tasks that everything looks important where do you start so it can mm -hmm. mean that you potentially end up getting easily distracted or procrastinating because everything is just competing for your attention instead and so that's ADHD. And then we'll move on to the last one that we that, that we, we mentioned in, and had as an option in the poll earlier, which is which is autism. Um, and autism uh, is is a quite a broad term, isn't it? 
Steph, mm -hmm. just take us through a definition of autism as well. Yeah, so it is a spectrum condition. So it impacts how a person would perceive or communicate with the world and interact with others. Um, mm -hmm. And like you said, it is that it is that broad, it's a spectrum condition. And that's because there are associated with strengths and challenges and they vary wildly from person to person. There will be consistent mm -hmm. traits, but there will be varying strengths and challenges. So it makes it more of a spectrum condition because people will sit differently. Um, mm -hmm. And there's a lot of different terminology when it comes to autism. There's autism spectrum conditions or disorders, so ASC or ASD, Asperger's, high functioning. And some of these terms have um, maybe aren't as frequently used anymore or have the controversy behind them, um, mm -hmm. but they aren't necessarily separate. They all will fit as autism. Again, let's let's focus on strengths first. So there are there are a huge amount of strengths that come yeah. from autism or, or being on different parts of that autism spectrum just take us through some of the strengths yeah there are, there are so many strengths and you might even be familiar with some of them just from um things in the media through certain films but aren't necessarily truly representative I'm not yeah sure. So I'm, not, I'm not sure they're always helpful those representations are they <laughs> exactly but we do see when it comes to autism amazing skills in technical areas like science and maths amazing memory um, some may say refreshing honesty and reliability as well. <laughs> uh, refreshing depending on the context, I'm sure. Exactly. But it's one of those key skills that sometimes is required, um, mm -hmm. along with just that preciseness and just really amazing attention to detail as well. And the challenges? Yeah, so with autism, it can make it difficult to pick up uh, social cues and interpret them as well. So social interaction can be difficult as they might have difficulty reading other people or expressing their own emotion. And we can also mm. see difficulty when it comes to things like changes in daily routine or finding it difficult or uncomfortable mm -hmm. when things change as well. Mm. Um, so if I go into more detail around social communication, the, mm. the common thing we see is uh, terms being taken fairly literally. Um, so a very basic example that might be more relevant for a child, but it might highlight what I'm referring to. So phrases like break a leg, which typically yeah. has positive intentions. So before you go on stage or before you do something big, it's, you know, someone might say break a leg. Um, yeah. That could be quite confusing if you take it in that literal term. <laughs> yes. um, yeah, it can be. Yeah. So taking and expressing emotion in an expected way as well when it comes to social communication, it might not align what we expect when someone with autism expresses their emotion. So when we start to think about interacting with colleagues and others, it might take longer to process information. So we might try to read those facial expressions and we don't necessarily understand what the facial expression and the term that they're saying means because sometimes we take both of those to understand the context behind someone's expression or term or explanation but when we don't mm -hmm. understand the the congruence between the facial expression and the terminology it can make it really difficult uh, to interact with colleagues as well so to someone else the what they're saying and the look on their face may not match for want of a better phrase that's it. That's exactly it. So what we're saying, sometimes we need to take those facial expressions and maybe even the tone of what's being said to really understand the context behind that term or that explanation. But if we don't pick up that tone or that facial expression, we can only take the literal sense of what's being said. Um, tell me a bit, yeah, I was going to say, tell me a little bit more about some of the behaviours as well. Yeah, so we all see difficulties with certain behaviours, like um, not only difficulties, but we see repetitive and restrictive behaviours. So doing the same thing repetitively over and over again. That mm. can be for fun, um, but it can also be to manage anxiety or highly focused um, areas of interest. So whether that's uh, particularly playing with a necklace or a particular thing or item um, or just having a really strong interest in a particular area. Um, we see this manifest in different ways, um, which isn't necessarily a challenge, um, but it mm. can be that really uh, intense interest that it can impact um, other aspects of life as well. Mm. That's a really interesting thing that you said about it. It may not actually be a challenge at all. It might be just a behaviour mm. that they're doing to manage an anxiety. And often mm. they're possibly managing an anxiety better than other people might uh, by That's doing that particular behaviour. It actually can be very constructive, can't it? Yeah, definitely. And we also see difficulties around um, managing changes and new scenarios. So when we're talking about these things like anxiety, we can imagine 
um, these kind of changes bring in, bring in through those feelings of anxiety. So um, a change in office location or a, a change in the day, maybe a meeting that's supposed to go ahead has been moved. That can cause a lot of feelings of anxiety and distress as well. So there are different ways of sort of managing those feelings, which can be those repetitive behaviours or um, that sort of repetitive over and over again type behaviour. Uh -huh. And the way you've described that, you can start to see already how this might be challenging in a workplace setting, right? We, we hear a lot about when we're talking about recruitment, for example, you hear a lot of people talking about fit and cultural mm -hmm. fit, where if you've got someone who interacts differently socially, it might be easy for people to feel like they're not a fit um, uh, for their team in the same way that someone who doesn't manage change without a lot of anxiety you can you know we we, we talk a lot uh, on inside hr about that ability to be adaptable to to manage change that can be challenging for people um, with autism can't it yeah definitely and it starts to bring across um aspects like masking and that's the area where those with autism will mask basically their true their true selves um mm -hmm. to try and fit into those job fits and then that creates that whole idea we're trying to be inclusive and have people be themselves in the workplace rather than spend all their energy trying to fit into what is on that job description or what is expected of them as well and probably leads to a lot more anxiety uh, so it sort of becomes a bit of a vicious cycle and 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 ultimately leads to lower performance which is which mm -hmm. is the the opposite of, of the aim of every organization just one note before we move off autism stuff and this came up when you and I spoke during the week there's a really interesting aspect around diagnosis for this isn't there that, that, that can be a diversity issue in its own right yeah definitely there is that uh, gender diagnosis gap when it comes to autism mm. so women are less likely to receive that diagnosis there are a few theories um a common one relates to what I mentioned around masking that women are more likely to mask and do it so well that mm. those that don't around them don't necessarily pick up traits but again you can imagine the amount of energy spent trying to be somebody else basically so it's more common to do that in the workplace and at school um, and also um, the diagnostic profile for autism is typically based on research done on males so mm. it may be that sort of prevalence and it that focus that is more um, focusing on the male brain rather than women as well um, mm -hmm. so there are a few theories about as to why there is that gender diagnosis gap Mm. No, and 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 it was great to 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 hear about that during the week because it was an issue that I it never occurred to me. And you've we've got a diversity issue within a diversity issue, which is which is typical, I guess. But 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 something that hadn't occurred to me before we spoke this week, and and, mm. and it's great to be able to talk to our audience about that today. So so mm. thank you for that. Um, let's let's then talk a little bit about we, why organisations need to be paying attention to this, why this is such an issue, and also. We know that this isn't an exhaustive list, as, as you mentioned earlier. There's so many, um, so many other neurodiverse conditions as well that we could talk about, um, and, and we've only got an hour, so we can't. But, but why should organisations be focused yeah. on neurodiverse employees? So we we touched upon the strengths as we were going through of neurodiverse conditions, which sort of start to highlight why we should start to focus our efforts in this area. Mm. But neurodiverse employees, they just need their employer to be able to see those strengths alongside those challenges to mm. really be able to embrace that potential by whether that's making necessary adjustments to their workplace, but just ensuring that they have an equitable experience at work. You know, those skills that neurodiverse employees bring to the workplace, they're often those that are really highly sought out. So, for example, a report by uh, JP Morgan Chase found that professionals in its Autism at Work initiative made fewer errors and were 90 to 140 percent more productive than neurotypical employees. Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's, and that's a big margin. That's 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 a significant increase. Exactly. That different way of thinking has really brought a uh, new perspective to the team and it's really promoting innovation so rather than having the same person over and over again within a team which doesn't really bring any diversity to, to thought this is bringing through those new perspectives those new ways of working and we're seeing more productivity and different ways and different benefits of doing that as well mm, and that's 
And we talked earlier about how diversity in general is at the forefront of the conversation now, finally, and, and that's such mm -hmm. a great progression that we've been through. And, and, and it's, it's been coming for a while. We, it's certainly been accelerated with the events of the last couple of years, for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think what we've taken a lot of care to do on Inside HR and, and we've done today is to talk about the benefits of this commercially, not just, you know, as it, not not just talk about this as an ethical question. We're talking about this as a commercial advantage, aren't we? Yeah, that's it. So, you know, hiring and supporting your neurodiverse employees, they bring so many significant benefits to your organization. I've just talked about productivity just then when it comes to that that piece of research or that initiative at JP Morgan Chase. But yes, it's moving you to an equitable organization, but it, it is kind of also just the right thing to do in a way as well. So there's just so many benefits on different perspectives and different ways you look at it to really fostering that inclusive culture while considering your neurodiverse population as well. So when we listen and celebrate what is both common and different, we become wiser, more inclusive and better as an organization. So mm -hmm. that's just really key to like really summarize and really put together the why behind that. You mm -hmm. know, there's those benefits of we become wiser as an organization, as a population, as a world. We're more inclusive and we become better as an organization. That really puts together that why and kind of leads mm -hmm. them really nicely into sort of creating that, that inclusive culture as well. Mm. And, and that does tee us up to talking a little bit about barriers, um, which, which, as we promised on our agenda, we, we were going to do. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of the audience from the, from the discussion we've had in the first half of this are already aware of a lot of the barriers that exist and, and, and that sort of common acceptance of what workplaces look like and how that can be a barrier to some of the, the, the people with, with some of the neurodiverse conditions that we've, we've discussed. Um, a lot of workplace practices have been built with um, I think the phrase we use is neurotypical brains mm. in mind. So, Steph, just take us through the barriers uh, for, for those who are not neurotypical. Yeah. yeah, so first off, talking about diagnosis. You know, some people were able to receive that diagnosis in childhood. You know, their parents or teachers may have had that understanding or awareness to spot those traits and mm. put that child forward for an assessment. However, for a lot of people, you'll find that their tendencies weren't picked up in childhood. And once they're out of education, it becomes much more difficult to receive that diagnosis as an adult. Mm. You know, just a few things. There's the long waiting list via the NHS in the UK uh, or for some conditions such as dyslexia. Assessments are actually only available privately, which brings forward the issue of cost. Just, without... just give us a ballpark of what a private assessment for dyslexia might cost for, can... for, for an individual or for a family. It can vary, but it's going to set you back quite a few hundred. So whether it's 500 wow. to 1,000 pounds, it is wow. a, big, a big chunk um, of money. That means that without that diagnosis, it's quite difficult to seek support either through yeah. public health services or from your organisation, right? That's right. So it's for a lot of organisations, they require that diagnosis report to be able to then go to the next step of reasonable adjustments or at an interview process. You need to take that report with you to show, you know, do you need extra time? The, without that report, you have no starting point and it's difficult to put forward and get that support that you need. Following a diagnostic, a diagnostic process, if you're lucky enough to have one, there are then huge barriers when you come to enter a workplace, aren't there? Yeah, so it's very much, universe is it's a group that's often overlooked. And I do question, are recruiters confident when they are managing applications from neurodiverse uh, potential employees? And it leads to that dilemma as to whether or not that neurodiverse applicant should disclose their condition so they can receive those adjustments mm. at the application process. Mm. Do they feel confident that they're not going to be judged or stigmatized for, for saying they have that neurodiverse condition? And if someone does have one poor experience, can you imagine sort of the confidence issues that then arise when you start to apply for other roles and other jobs? It is mm. off-putting and it, you're unlikely to probably say you do have a neurodiverse condition at any point once you've received that, stigmati that stigmatism that one time. And it's a, it's a deeply personal decision to do that. It's, it's a deeply subjective one. But mm -hmm. what you would hope is that there is an environment where everyone who chooses to disclose that 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 condition can do so. And that is a huge barrier at the moment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's an ideal world is that it's easy. You just present your, you, you know, your diagnosis and you get the support that's required. But without having that accessible workforce, organizations are very much turning away their own potential talent without having that accessibility in place to begin with. 
talk about entering the workplace. We're now going to talk about the challenges staying in the workforce. Um, just talk us a little bit through that. And, we, and we, that word yeah. always keeps appearing, doesn't it? Which is culture. Just talk <laughs> us a little bit about talk us a little bit about that. Yeah, and that's it. And a few comments, um, questions have come through around how we've got employees that potentially show traits, but they don't say anything or haven't mentioned mm. anything. Mm. And that will, a culture is a big part of that. If you have a culture that doesn't necessarily allow for much flexibility in the workplace, it can make it difficult for your neurodiverse employees to work in a way that's best for them. Mm. And if an employee does feel like um, they may be negatively treated or stigmatized due to having a neurodiverse condition because of that culture of the organization, they are going to be less likely to disclose and seek support. And that mm. then impacts reasonable adjustments as well. Mm. So, and, and what, what kind of when we talk about reasonable, and, and again, the word reasonable is is such a key word in in employment law, in 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 HR policy, in um, uh, all kinds of areas of employment. When we talk about reasonable adjustments, I know some of it can be complicated, but some of it can be really simple as well, can't it? So simple. It can be a case of you know just a bit of assistive software, or assistive tech. It can be the case mm. of just sending an agenda. Uh, before a meeting so someone can read it through so they can focus purely on the meeting rather than focusing on text that was also sent alongside that there are mm-hmm. lots of simple measures but the really key thing is working with that individual to understand what is reasonable and what are those adjustments that would be would be appropriate but mm-hmm. from a study conducted by text help we see that 64 percent of neurodivergent workers believe their organization could be doing more to support people with a neurodiverse condition. So that's a lot of people that don't feel like they feel yeah, like they're more they're too done. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and without these tools, it can be difficult, can't it, to sort yeah. of for an employee to feel like they they can develop and grow within an organization. This, I mean, obviously we we talk about neurodiversity often affecting learning. Um, mm. But but in a, in a workplace context, we're talking about people's career development as well, it, and it, it can really present some barriers there, can't it? Yeah, definitely. And you know, Court Trump's found that career development is the number one reason that employees remain or leave their organisation. And mm. without those, you know, reasonable adjustments or those tools that are required to develop someone's abilities, neurodiverse employees will have difficulties when approaching their own learning and development or their career prospects. And it's very difficult to sort of see your next stage in your career without having those things in place um, to be able to progress in your own learning and development as well. Let's talk about how we how we help. Let's talk about how we create an inclusive environment um, uh, uh, in, in your workplaces uh, or wherever it is that, that, that you are you are working at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, Steph, let's start. I mean, the obvious one, I guess, is is around listening. Yeah. Yeah, so just really listening to your employee's experience. I kind of decided to talk about that around reasonable adjustments. But the really key thing to start off with, so a few people obviously are starting their journey, but the key thing to start with is really assessing what your current culture is about. What is it What is it saying? And a really key way of doing that is by just finding out, surveying, ask your employees. So if you can measure how inclusive your organisation is with some research-backed templates, you can use those results to really show you where or how different groups of employees experience your company's culture, whether there's some discrepancies based on being neurodiverse and so on. Mm. So, and Coltramp has some templates for this that they've that, that have been based on research. Yeah, that's it. So um, with Coltramp's templates, you've got sort of seven evidence-based and research-driven constructs. So they include some on screen there, belonging, decision-making, fairness, opportunities, voice, also diversity, that contribution to a broader purpose. So using that will help you take that snapshot of how diversity and inclusion is at your organization and see where the discrepancies are. Mm-hmm. And and when we and when we talk about listening to uh, to, to employees, there, there is and we and we talk about this with all employee listening. We talk about it with engagement surveys, with everything else. Mm-hmm. There is a danger then if you do this that then if you don't act on it afterwards, there's then a there's, it almost yeah. has a, a negative effect, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. The questions you ask, they really send out a signal to employees about what's important. Um, Mm. But the really key thing there is you do create that sort of implicit promise that you'll take action on those results that show that disparate experience. So it's really key to have that post listening phase and take that action. You know, if if your employees are taking the time to discuss the experience, 
they're going to lose confidence if they don't see anything being done afterwards. Let's talk a little bit about then communication um, uh, yeah. and, and, and how you communicate uh, and, and create a culture of communication with neurodiverse employees. Yeah, so when it comes to, again, listening, you want to make that two-way and really foster that open communication. So it's really key to understand each person's needs because it's not a one-sheet fits all. And I think the really key thing, and this might answer some of the questions as well, is your managers. Your managers are going to be really key. So we really want to help enable your managers to be able to have um, conversations in this way. So you see on screen there, um, sort of one-to-one platform, uh, cool trans platform in one-to-ones. So you want to be able to have your managers really discuss the goals of their employees, to have open, honest conversations within those one-to-ones where they can discuss preferences and support. You know, you want to take that more sort of person-centered approach rather than label focused and focusing on what the label says, take an individual centered approach. You want to also be able to enable managers to understand what reasonable adjustments look like. How do they work for that individual? What adjustments could there be? So I mentioned a few around assistive tech, but it could just be uh, sensory adjustments like lighting or the heating, whatever that might be. It may even be need to be adaptable, but we need to have that open and honest conversation between the manager and the direct report to be able to do that. And this is such a key time now to really make use of those more digitally led resources to really overcome those challenges. So when it comes to focusing on development, performance, engagement, as you see on the screen, you need to be able to make use of something that is fostering that communication between that individual and their manager as well. Those checking questions, they really address the whole employee experience rather than just focusing on tactical updates. It's more about, like you see, well-being, growth, and so on. And it also might highlight the need for awareness training within your organization. That might be needed to enable those managers and uh, their colleagues as well. Let's talk a little bit about um, what you've called here an employee resource group, ERG. Um, uh, yeah. Just tell us what that is and how they can help. Uh, so ERGs, employee resource groups, they're very much sort of um, voluntary identity-based communities that are formed by the employees in the company. So in this case, for example, at CultureAmp, we have uh, Camp ID, so Camp Invisible Disabilities. So that is a group where specific identities that are characterised in that demographic um, mm -hmm. become they're sort of formed together there are different considerations when it when you come to create an ERG so you want to look at the makeup of your own organization to really understand is there interest in forming an ERG mm -hmm. the benefit of that from a business perspective is that you know if you can highlight that you have ERGs that focus on your diversity for example that would attract more neurodiverse uh, talent into your organization and also mm -hmm. foster and build that community within the organization as well Mm, so you can highlight them. You can highlight them on websites, on job boards, um, uh, and, mm -hmm. and make, make it a part of your sort of your your proposition for for potential employees. That's it. That's it. Another key thing as well is that you know we see ninety percent of Fortune five hundred companies do have ERG groups as part of their DI strategies, but only about five mm percent -hmm. of them actually compensate the ERG leaders uh, for their you know their their work that they bring to the organization. So again, it's wow. really key to make sure that. We also compensate our ERG leaders rather than make them do extra work when they're already neurodiverse to sort that's of really that sort of organization as well. That's really interesting. So 90 percent of 40, 90, sorry, 90 uh, percent of Fortune 500 companies have employee resource groups, but only five percent of them actually pay the leaders of them to do, do all that work. That's that's, that's really interesting. So, yeah, that's that's mm -hmm. um, an area of awareness um, for sure. Um, and, and we want to finish by, by talking about, again, regular listeners of Inside HR will, will think that this is me doing this because obviously my of my specialist interest in learning and development. But let's finish with talking a little bit about learning and development and how that can be um, uh, can be better designed for neurodiverse employees. Yeah, so development, um, it looks different to everybody. You know, some people want to reach and go more senior. Some people mm. just want to be in a role that they enjoy doing. Some people want to become a manager. Some And everything's just different for everybody. So success in a career just looks different. Hence the need to sort of really deliberately create individual tailored career plans for each individual or each mm. employee, especially as everything is changing in the world of work, priorities mm. are changing and so on. So you can see their Cultramps tool develop on screen there. And with tools like that, you can really support your employees in seeing what the development opportunities are available, but mm. also help your managers again, have those meaningful growth conversations with their employees and also allow your HR teams that don't necessarily have much visibility 
this gives them that visibility of development activities as well. So as we're shifting from more conventional prescriptive types of development opportunities, having more human conversations, just as that with managers or even mentors, that can really be a big, a big beneficial step. So connecting mm -hmm. your employees with one another, that can be really supportive in not just career advice, but also being an advocate for that individual or playing an active role in, in creating those opportunities as well. So I just think it's really key that if you want to retain that talent and that diversity of thought, giving them an environment where they can feel engaged and motivated at every step of that career journey, whether it's through mentors or managers as well. Let's just finish with this quote here, which I, which again, we talked about in the week and I know you're, you're, you're very fond of. Just, just tell us a little bit about what this means for you. Yeah, so again, I read the quote. So a diverse mix of voices, a uh, mix of voices leads to better discussions, decisions and outcomes for everyone. And that just really mm. highlights that, you know, those small changes can make such a big impact.